listen, even though you're a uh, Greek from origin and you're in London and you've taught at Harvard, you actually know a lot about Africa. Uh, now, I, mean, I, I wouldn't say Africa is a very complex, very heterogeneous, very beautiful place. So I wouldn't claim that I know that much. But together with Stelios Michalopoulos, who is another fellow Greek uh, working at Brown University in the U.S., we have been studying uh, African uh, economic history over the past uh, eight to nine years, since the time that I was working at Dartmouth and the Stelios was working at Tufts. And in a series uh, of papers of academic uh, research, having an empirical uh, angle, we have been reassessing with quantitative techniques the lasting effects, for example, of colonization, pre-colonial aspects, or most or more recent post-independent uh, factors. Now, I know you've written uh, many, many pages, like what, a 90-page report or 70-page report? Yeah, I mean, we wrote a piece for the Journal of Economic Literature, which aims to summarize the vast research that has occurred in the past 20 years, not only in economics, but also in political science, sociology, and history, uh, that tries to shed light on the deep origins of African development, or if you like, underdevelopment. And this body of research connects the lack of convergence and growth on Africa post-independence to the preceding colonial era, the preceding to the colonial era, which were marked by the African slave trades, and also even to deeper features related to geology, geography, ecology, and other factors. Okay, and what were some of those key takeaways, Professor, that you learned? I know it's terrible to summarize these things up as sound bites because this is a very complex, nuanced subject with no clear answer sometimes. Still, for somebody who doesn't know much about African borders, what would you start by saying? Well, let, let me give you the narrative of how things played. Uh, when colonization starts uh, in the Americas and subsequently it spreads to India and Asia, uh, European colonizers view Africa as a labor preserve. So they commence this very dark era for African history, the slave trades. Europeans say actually uh, set up tiny I wouldn't even say communities, they just embark mostly on the western shore of Africa, then they find uh, the indigenous uh, slave, slavery was practiced by many indigenous African tribes, and then they deport the slaves, they ship them at the other side uh, of the Atlantic, mostly to Salvador, Brazil, to Cuba and the Caribbean and the southern part of the U.S., and during the period of, roughly speaking, three centuries, the contact of Europeans with the, with the black continent was mostly to extract labor, effectively, and ship them mostly to the Americas, to a lesser extent also uh, in Asia. Now, we have uh, the period of the commercial revolution, if I was to say, with the cross-Atlantic trade and also the Silk Route, if you prefer. And then subsequently, we have industrialization in Western Europe, in this country, in the UK, which quickly spreads in the US and Canada. And roughly speaking, in the period 1850 till 1900, uh, when the world prices of commodities actually skyrocket because of the industrialization, Europeans' actually interest now on, on the continent starts becoming mostly now, not anymore to extract labor, but to extract commodities. Mm -hmm. Rubber, cotton, uh, palm oil, as time went by, also gold, platinum, and other raw materials. So effectively, during the period that has been coined as the scramble for Africa, which roughly speaking starts 1860, 1870, and is completed by 1905, roughly speaking, we have the French, the British, to a lesser extent also Germany and Belgium playing some role there in partitioning the largely unexplored continent into free trade areas, protectorates, colonies. The objective at the time was to exploit the continent. Uh, so this strategy had, uh, colonization Africa had an exploitive angle clearly. And there was also a, perhaps you know, an effort to educate Africa, build some infrastructure, for example, railroads, build some schools, some health clinics. But 
very quickly, uh, European powers decided uh, to outsource, for example, the provision of health and education to Christian missions, uh, because they found it, and to private corporations that they were raising funds from Europe, and through concessionary type of agreements, they were exploiting the country, the, the, the continent. Uh, so effectively, European colonization in Africa, there was huge heterogeneity, as you pointed out. Uh, but for example, if I was to focus on Congo Free State, which perhaps is the most notorious uh, a, a period of colonial extraction under King Leopold II of Belgium, what we had, uh, uh, Congo Free State is something like bigger than Western Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was initially a private colony for King Leopold II. So how would, could he rule this? Effectively, he carved this very big area into pieces of land. He outsourced them into private corporations that they were raising capital from European cities. And they were trying to extract rubber, cotton, or all of the riches uh, of Congo. Now, according to the plan, uh, those private corporations should have also provided some schools, some basic infrastructure, but those were extremely limited. In this case, they were almost absent. Now, the other what's actually quite interesting uh, aspect during colonization, so now colonization commences in Africa, roughly speaking, the key date perhaps is 1884, 1885, when Otto Bismarck, von Bismarck organizes a conference in Berlin where Europeans partition Central Africa and lay out also the foundations for the partitioning of the largely unexplored uh, uh, continent. Now, because of that, uh, we have the very peculiar states nowadays in Africa. We have uh, most African borders follow latitudinal or longitudinal lines, and uh, they're to a great extent artificial. As we study in our research uh, in something you have out of 830 ethnic groups, something like 230 were systematically partitioned by the colonial borders. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, as an outcome of those negotiations in Berlin, in Brussels, in London, and in Paris, we have some tiny countries such as Gambia or Equatorial Guinea, and some very large countries such as Congo Free State, what is today the Democratic Republic of Congo, not to say Sudan or Namibia, some other very big places. So the first, if you like, impact of colonization on the continent is the border design. Uh, to be a, a bit sympathetic to, uh, to the European powers at the time, this was not on purpose because actually all the historical records support the accidental nature of those borders and those colonial artifacts. At the time, nobody could foresee African independence. Nobody actually could, in Europe at least, could see that, you know, 80 or 90 years down the road, the African people will demand independence and we will have decolonization happening very, very fast. Mm -hmm. So, but however, one of the interesting aspects when one studies history, even when it comes from the economic side, is that we have many historical accidents that persist over time. And right. in the 50s and the 60s, when we have the end of colonization, effectively, Decolonization starts with the end of World War II, when the UK and France get out of the war very weakened, and effectively, starting with North Africa and then with Ghana, you have also the spread of uh, independence in the sub in Sub-Saharan Africa. By 1966 or so, something like 40, 42 countries were already independent. Mm -hmm. So those African borders persisted, with two or three exceptions. At the time, some scholars and some uh, people argue that perhaps that's the time to redesign the borders. But of course, neither the departing Europeans nor the leaders of African independence wanted to touch this very delicate issue, which is how you redesign uh, borders. Again, with uh, one or two exceptions. Plus, at the time, there was this uh, very, uh, uh, very vibrant wave of uh, Pan-Africanism. And, and this type of ideology. So the leaders of African independence, for example, Julius Nyerere, among others, they really thought that by becoming independent and by perhaps implementing some nation building policies, though this part that seemed to be Tanzania or you know, German Eastern Africa could become a homogeneous country. Mm -hmm. uh, what we show in our research, Sergius Michalopoulos and I, which was published at the American Economic Review 
uh, in 2016, is that if one looks at conflict today in Africa, uh, Africa is the most civil conflict prone continent in the world post independence. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of conflict uh, in those areas uh, at the border where split by the national border ethnicities reside. Mm -hmm. Clearly conflict in Africa has uh, many origins. Mm -hmm. uh, by far it's not only the colonial border design that led to state artificiality, but what we clearly show in our research using very fine georeference data on the exact location of battles between mm -hmm. rebel forces and government uh, troops or one-sided violence against the civilian population and fights among uh, militias is that those tend to be concentrated in those homelands where split by the border ethnic groups uh, reside. We further show that those split by the border ethnicities tend to be repressed by the central government. Mm -hmm. And we further find that when one neighboring country wants to intervene in another country next door, typically they will use as a conduit those split by the border ethnic groups. Okay. Now, you said a lot of fascinating things there. And so I, I want to go in 10,000 directions. But... We'll start with just the last thing that you were talking about, about the, the, the borders you showed. And I actually read that part of your paper, Professor, where you showed that statistically conflicts happen near the border uh, between uh, groups that were split, correct? Yeah. And so my question is, how does that compare? And in fact, toward the end of your paper, you say that we need to do the similar study on other continents as well. This, yeah. this, and that gets to my point, which is, it seems to me that many conflicts, whether it happens in Asia, Afghanistan, whatever, and, or in Europe uh, or South America, they were situations where people um, were near the border. And a lot of times that ethnic groups would be uh, crushed. Is that not the case? I, don't, I know that you haven't studied or at least formally studied the rest of the, of the world. But my guess is, is Africa that different in that respect regarding conflicts happening and being concentrated near the border? Well, that's, that's, that's a great question, Francis. So let me just elaborate on a couple of issues here. Mm -hmm. There are many reasons why we may see a lot of conflict in border areas. First mm -hmm. of all, if states are weak, and many African states are weak, it's hard for them to broadcast political power far from the capital. So perhaps it's natural to see that far from the capital, you see a lot of, uh, of uh, lack of rule of law. What we do in our analysis is we go at the border and we simply compare in the same border segment, if you like, an area where you have, by mistake, a split group, think about the Maasai at the border between Tanzania and Kenya, and a nearby group that, you know, perhaps by luck or by accident, it was not split. So, going to the, the second part of your question, what about outside Africa? Uh, I think that you are absolutely right, and there have been some statistical uh, papers uh, showing that those countries where the borders are straight lines, so more likely to be artificial rather than organic, there seems to be a bit more conflict, especially from nearby countries intervening in the, in the affairs of, of the country next door. Okay. So your intuition is absolutely right. Third, uh, let me add to your thinking that uh, let me go to a really sad story now in the Middle East. Now, people from the Middle East uh, I believe, perhaps rightly so, that part of the problems that we observe in the Middle East come from the infamous Sykes-Pickett Agreement of 1915, where those two diplomats, France and Brit, uh, actually split uh, that part of the world, this was the time when the Ottoman Empire was disintegrated. And, uh, uh, you know, the Islamic State, uh, in some of the videos that they had circulated on the web, which I don't urge your viewers to, to, to watch, but they do show that, uh, that with uh, maps that one of the problems uh, in the Middle East are the borders as delineated by Sykes and Pickering. Mm -hmm. So the issue, however, which actually makes Africa very fascinating to study this global, as you rightly pointed out, issue, is the fact that borders were designed at some 
time where nobody could foresee African independence. Mm -hmm. And to a first approximation, Europeans didn't have much knowledge of local conditions where they were at the time of the border delineation. While mm -hmm. Sykes and Pico had a very good understanding of the borders of the Middle East when they were joined. So from, if you like, from a scientific standpoint, the fact that borders in Africa are to a great extent, I wouldn't say fully random, but have a significant random element or lack of knowledge element, makes this a very appealing from an academic standpoint. But you're absolutely right that those lessons carry out to other places, uh, and there are many other places, of border artificiality. Okay. Now, another question I had is, you're familiar with, in fact, you mentioned it in your research paper, uh, I think you pronounce it Murdoch? Yeah. So Murdoch was this guy, I think it was 1960 or maybe it was 1950s? Somewhere around there. He, yeah, so George Peter Murdoch is a very famous and very controversial uh, anthropologist uh, who studied ethnic groups across the world. Actually, he was, his expertise was not Africa, uh, but in a series uh, of, uh, of articles and uh, academic work uh, published in the journal Ethnology, he produced some maps of pre-colonial Africa, or to be more accurate, of Africa at the time of colonization. At the beginning. So, at the beginning, I mean, yeah. again, at the beginning of as you pointed out, it's a very big continent, right. and the information that Murdoch was collecting from secondary sources is not exactly at the beginning of colonization in every period. Roughly speaking, his famous uh, ethnographic map of Africa covers 1860 till 1920, I would say. Okay, so my point is that if you look at that map that Murdoch draw, and again, it doesn't matter whether it's perfectly accurate or not for my point. I've got here, for those who are watching, uh, uh, the map of Africa. But basically, you'll see, and you mentioned it earlier in our conversation, some 820 territories, if you will. Yeah, or 825 ethnic groups. ethnic groups. Correct. And so when people fault Af uh, the Europeans for having done these poor and, and silly and random borders and cutting across ethnic groups, um, it, I look at that map and just imagine that I had a pen in my hand and somebody told me, okay, now draw a map of Africa. I mean, sorry, uh, some states in Africa, create states. I know that if I created 825 countries, I think people would go crazy and say, whoa, 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 you're dividing this, country, this continent into two little small pieces. So by force, I would have to clump tribes together and ethnic groups together. And there's just no way around that. And also because it's not as neat as even the Murdoch map, which by the way, doesn't look very neat at all since you have 825 territories, you know that there's overlap. Just like if somebody says, hey, draw a map and, and show the Hispanics in America in one place and the uh, non-Hispanics in another place, there's a lot of borders, uh, a lot of areas where there's not a clear delineation, a, a strong 90% are on one side of the train tracks and the other 90% are on the other side of, I mean, so the other 10% are on the other side of the train tracks, right? So I'm, just, I'm, I'm trying to have a little bit of sympathy for these poor Europeans who had this pen in their hand and had to try to figure out where to draw a map. Uh, I don't know if anybody could have done anything different in that sense. Well, could, could it have, could, is it as bad as it, as, as we all think it is, could the Africans have done better? Was the African map prior to the colonization, let's say if, if Europeans had never come into the picture, could the African situation be all that different? Would the, would the, uh, would the geography look all that different? Well, you make many good points and you conclude with the question that has bothered Cecil Rhodes, Vladimir Lenin, Ilich Lenin, you know, the most prolific, uh, you know, uh, Daron Atsemoglu, many people have been debating what, how Africa would have looked like in the absence of colonization. This is an extremely hard uh, question to answer scientifically. Uh, when I say scientifically, uh, actually, you know, if you read uh, those influential scholars, they have a lot of intuition, a lot of insights. When I say scientifically, I mean with hard data. Why it's very hard to assess how Africa would have looked like in the absence of colonization is because it's very hard to think about this counterfactual. Right. So you are absolutely right that this is something that, you know, it's always a debate. Right. Let me go to your sec your first question, which is perhaps 
It's still very hard to answer, but perhaps mm -hmm. less hard. Now, nobody is arguing, clearly not I, nor neither I nor Stelios, that you know we know how to design the borders. Now, let me tell you what we do know. The first thing that we do know is that those borders of African states, when Europeans drew them, they were not meant to be the borders of states. So this we know with certainty. Mm -hmm. Second, to give an example, since I started with the, with the Congo Free State, Congo Free State is so big because it went neither to France nor to the United Kingdom at the time, the important colonial powers. It went to Belgium and King Leopold. Uh, King Leopold was related to Queen Victoria, so the British thought that he would play along with them. He had received a lot of funding from French banks. They all thought that he would go bankrupt and effectively the French would have the first say. So it was like a bit of an accident that he got that. Right. Secondly, as the name implies, Congo Free State, it was meant to allow a lot of commerce, both of British and French and also other Europeans. So third, those concessionary companies that were effectively ruling Congo, because King Global didn't spend time in Congo, effectively were multinationals. They were raising bonds, uh, actually complex bond instruments, shares in Europe. They had main investors. They were sending mercenaries. They were using local chiefs as, as, as a conduit of their power. So effectively, the point here is that they were not meant to be states. Even the fact that we assign Congo free state to Belgium is not exactly true. You had like many Europeans and non-Europeans actually, you know, trying to get some of the riches uh, uh, of Congo. The same applies, for example, to give you another example, Mozambique. Mozambique effectively, although it is a Portuguese colony, for a significant period of colonial time, it was effectively ruled as three distinct colonies, with the Portuguese having the power in the southern part, close to the capital Maputo, then having two concessionary companies, uh, one in the center uh, around the port city of Beira and one in the north towards Nankala and Ampula, where so effectively, although it seemed like one colony, effectively there were three. Mm -hmm. Ghana, Gold Coast, again, was three distinct uh, colonies protectories, the Asante, the Northern Territories, uh, and, and the Gold Coast. So even during the colonial times, it was not exactly British or exactly French. True, there was a protectorate, uh, a, a, a protection power. So effectively, the, the message here is that colonization was much more nuanced, if you like. And clearly, one never argues that Africa should have been split into 825 different uh, uh, mono-ethnic, if you like, type of countries. But what is the big difference in Africa versus Europe is that in Europe, the states, in some sense, emerged organically through a lot of fighting, but there was a process where the various little kingdoms and ducates in Germany, they came together. Hmm. Uh, there was at times, actually during the French Revolution and during the Italian unification times, you know, most French or most Italians wouldn't speak the same language. So they were like from different, what we will coin today as different ethnicities. But there was a process, if you like, of assimilation and centralization of power and also of people. Mm -hmm. The trick in Europe was compulsory primary education, which homogenized Italy, which homogenized France, which homogenized even my country, Greece, mm -hmm. which were way smaller. This process didn't happen with Africa because borders were designed in this quick and dirty way. They persisted independence. And then think about Nigeria. You had people from a hundred different groups trying for the very first time to decide together on public goods, on language, setting up security, deciding how to share the rents from palm oil, subsequently of oil. So these were hard questions that European states decided, if you like, in a much more gradual and organic process alongside industrialization. While Africa never had, if you like, this luxury because it was oppressed during colonization and also oppression starts, let me repeat, even in the preceding to colonization period with the slave trade. There's one uh, part of your paper that I'm not clear on, uh, Professor, where you talk about 
proximity to, I think, a coastal area. There's lakes and there's a different, uh, like a correlation between all these things. And then there's a table that shows all these correlations. Can you explain a little bit more about some of the conclusions and findings that you had in that table? Because I couldn't really understand what you were trying to get at when you were looking at all those factors. I don't know if you remember what I'm talking about. I do. <laughs> uh, so let me just uh, uh, try to explain what we're doing here. Uh, so effectively, our analysis is based on three maps. The first is George Peter Murdoch's anthropological ethnographic map that delineates the spatial distribution of ethnicities, roughly speaking, due at, in the beginning of colonization. As you rightly point out, Murdoch assigns each polygon to a dominant ethnic group, although right. in reality there was mixing. And that, mixing oh, hold on, hold on. That's a real, I just want to, for those who are listening in, that's a really, really important point because I th sometimes think that when people talk about that the colonizers divided tribes they have this image in their head that they are these neat little tribes all put together when in fact it's not the case i mean you look at your own country greece you have many different you have albanians are kind of spilling over into the country you have uh north macedonians coming in the slavic kind of people there you have the turks you have the bulgarians they're all you know all these sorts of different tribes are kind of spilling into the quote-unquote greek tribe <laughs> Correct. Uh, let me add some, some caveats to here. First of all, population density in colonial Africa was very low. Yes. So, true, there was population mixing, but it was not of the sort that you have in mind in the example you gave today. So this is clearly not the case. There was population mixing, but it was not as high as it is today, simply because there was a lot of land in Africa and not so much labor. Again, let me remind to your viewers that one of the most direct negative impacts of the slave trades is that it depleted the population of Africa. According to some quantitative estimates, the population of Africa in 1850 was half of what it would have been in the absence of the slave trade. Correct. And those concessionary companies that I mentioned before, if anything, they were competing for labor rather than land. Land was abundant. There was not so much labor. Correct, yeah. So, but going back to your original question, so effectively we take George Peter Murdoch's, which is the best, at least so far, many people are working on refining it, mm -hmm. mapping of ethnic groups across Africa. Then we portray on top the colonial borders that they were not meant to be for states, but they persisted African independence with some exceptions only. And then we overlay a contemporary data set that gives very finely disaggregated georeferenced information where conflict takes place. So the first part of our analysis, which refers to the table that you mentioned, we really want to show that the homelands of split groups, like the Maasai, like the Ewe, the big group split between uh, Togo, uh, and, uh, Togo and Ghana, uh, those homelands and those ethnic groups are not that different vis-a-vis -vis geography, ecology, and other characteristics to those groups that were not split. So effectively, you want to show that, look, something, you know, for example, happens to Francis, but not to Elias, but this to a first approximation is unrelated to where you live or what kind of geography is the place where you live, etc., etc. Once we show that, and our results show that there are no major differences in proximity to the coast, in proximity to main rivers, on whether the area has say, diamonds, gold, palm oil, etc., etc., this makes the comparison of non-split with split groups much more intuitive because on observable characteristics, they look similar. They are also very close to each other. So effectively then the statistical analysis does something very simple. It's not fancy if you like at all. I just compare whether two areas or two ethnic groups that look similar in geography, ecology, etc., have more or less conflict and whether this conflict, of course, is related to whether you are split or not. And our analysis shows that ethnicities that were partitioned during the colonial times have more conflict, both conflict 
targeting civilians and conflict between government forces and rebels and militias. Also, split groups are much more likely to face ethnic-based repression and be participating in ethnic-based civil wars as, as classified by political uh, scientists. And also you see intervention from neighboring countries being much more likely to occur in the homelands of those split groups. And knowing that those split groups and non-split groups are quite a quote similar across predetermined feature makes the point made also by African historians that to a first approximation of this process was, you know, entailed many random elements. Right. What about, <laughs> I'm trying to get at this notion that we have a tendency, I think sometimes, to look in the rear view mirror and try to explain all the problems that occurs in Africa and try to blame it sometimes all on the past. And I try to look at other continents for example, the European continent, the Asian continent. And, and I see, and if, by the way, South America was also colonized and they had their borders imposed on them as well. But, you know, Germany's borders, today's borders, Germany's has been imposed on them. Hungary's borders has been imposed on them. Um, a lot of borders, whenever you lose a war, you often have to have your borders imposed on them. And I also saw, Professor, an interesting uh, graph, and I should share it, that shows how the borders of Europe have changed in the last 1,000 years. And it's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> it's like watching this animation and you see like these accordions of the border just shifting all over the place for over the 1,000 years. And roughly every decade, the border somewhere in Europe changed. And yet Europe today is okay, even though despite now granted. And, and sometimes uh, it was the the people in Asia who came all the way and invaded into Europe. And so it's not always the Europeans creating conflict within themselves. Sometimes it was a quote unquote far away power who came and disrupted their life. And, and so, and yet Europe kind of functions today, more or less Asia kind of more or less functions today, more so than let's say Africa functions today. And so can we blame everything on these borders? And I'm not saying you're trying to blame everything in, in Africa on the borders, but sometimes I wonder if we place too much emphasis on the borders and the actions of these dead white people of 200, 300 years ago. Well, I think you raise a, a fascinating uh, question. Let me just clarify, let me put the, I really hate that, uh, what I'll do now. I'll, I'll put the academic hat, which okay. uh, I really don't like. <laughs> but w when, when, uh, an economics uh, research uh, uh, you know, study shows that something matters, does not mean it is the only thing that matters. Right. So when one says that you know, growing up in better neighborhoods in the United States you know, is associated with better outcomes, uh, which you know, neighborhoods have a causal effect on let's say, education or income, it doesn't mean that you know, your income or my income were determined by where we grew up. Right. 100%. Uh, so the first point is that African borders have played a role in fostering conflict and underdevelopment in Africa, but this is far, far from being the full picture. Mm -hmm. Colonization and the extractive natures of colonization, which were many in Africa, while the developmentalist aspects of colonization, education, health, railroads, roads, ports, were not that many, also played a role. But again, many other things played their role. Mm -hmm. Policies, for example, of uh, the newly uh, independent African state in the 60s and the 70s were not particularly sound. Mm -hmm. Africa was also the battlefield uh, during Cold War War. So the Soviet Union and the, the United States clearly had a role in holding Africa back. You could mm -hmm. rightly say that you know, the Cold War was also fought in Vietnam and parts of Asia. Which again is, an, is, is, or in many parts of Latin America, since you mentioned. But again, this shows that you know historical events matter, but for sure it's not the full picture. Right. Um, is there anything good about the borders that the colonialists ever did? In well, other words, is there any, anything that you say, okay, wow, that actually was pretty clever or smart, or was it all just? A screw up. Well, again, let me. Re I'm afraid that I will not be able to answer fully uh, this question. 
the only point is that when you say screw up, let me just repeat that those were not meant to be uh, borders of states. Actually, I forgot to mention that during colonization, you know, if you were a house in the north of Nigeria or the south of Niger, you would free. I mean, there was no border whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Effectively, the borders during colonization was, uh, since I mentioned the border between Niger and, uh, and Nigeria, if something valuable would be on the north side, the French would have the first say. If it was on the southern side of the border, it was mostly for the British to have the first mm. say. So those borders during the colonial times were mostly meant for Europeans and for European interests because Europeans never colonized Africa, especially England, rather than for Africans. And perhaps one reason why the Africans didn't object much onto that at the time was because it, they were not salient. They became salient mm. after independence. And even in the early stage, in the early years of independence, they were not again very salient with a lot of movement of people across the border. Uh, so now let me go to the point that you raised a bit earlier about Europe. Now there's a very famous uh, quote. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, one second. I'm going to play in the background for those who are watching on YouTube. Uh, and for you yourself, you should be able to see this uh, map of that. that I just told you about the 1000 years. You can see it there. Okay, I can see are, it. Are you, are you you're watching it? Yeah, I'm, yes, I am. Okay. So this starts in the year 1100 AD, and these are showing the maps. And the point of it is, as you can see, every year practically, or certainly every decade, the map of Europe has all been altered somewhere, on the, on, somewhere, somewhere. Um, but it's fascinating. So go ahead, make your, your point on Europe as this thing okay. plays out. But, but there is a very famous quote in political science coming from uh, Charles Steele, a very famous political scientist, who says, who has very nicely put it. Wars make states and states make war. Hmm. So in Europe, as your graph very nicely portrays, there was a lot of fighting. And this, of course, led to those changes of policy. But wasn't there fighting also in Africa while, you know, 500 no. years ago when the Europeans... Actually, were... no. Let, let me come to that. I, I, okay. I'm going exactly at this point. So we know that in Europe, you know, there was constant fighting, you know, the British against the French, the French against the, the Dutch, etc., etc. Now, this process allowed for the emergence and eventual consolidations of states. So at some point it became inefficient to have like, now your map has like myriads and dozens of little German mini states. At some point they consolidate. Right. Because they were facing the threat from another country. So during this time, effectively, you have land that is valuable. The aristocracy, which was landed, wanted protection of their property rights. The poloi, the public, were fighting for that. So some form of a social contract was formed, some armies were developed, and the very early vintages of taxation emerged. In Africa, this didn't happen. Now, you asked me about conflict in Africa. A caveat, we do not know much about pre-colonial Africa. So it's not like Europe or, you know, I come from Greece, you know, you go to every little town in Greece, you know, the history of this place going back 3,000 years at the, at the minute. Right. Now, however, all the evidence we have for the period before the 15th century is that there was not much conflict for actually a very simple reason. Land was abundant. So, you know, if you were living in some part uh, let's say of uh, Asante at the time, and you know, there was like some Ghana. invasion in, in I mean, there was no Ghana at the time in the right, Asante. Right, right. But uh, I mean, that's the Ghana uh, region. <laughs> yeah. Today's, today's so Ghana. The point, the point that many have made is that you could go further south. There was a lot of land. Well, if you think about it, so people have made this argument, many economists have made this argument about slavery and property rights. So in Europe, we have very early the development of property rights. Because if you think about it in Europe, high quality land is precious, there's not that much. And labor, relatively speaking, is the abundant factor of production. Go to Africa, most likely it's the other way around. You have a lot of high quality land, population density was small, so labor was, roughly speaking, the scarce force of production. Mm -hmm. So some economists, going back in time, like Smith and Marx and many others have made this point, that look, in a place where you have a lot of land, not much labor, well, slavery. 
in some other parts where you know you don't have you have pockets of high quality land and a lot of uh, workers wages will be low so no need if you like for slavery but rents must be high so let's protect property so the process of a lot of fighting in europe actually led it was destructive it was detrimental if you like in the short run but then in the long run it allowed the consolidation the emergence and consolidation of states while you go in africa it was the most likely the other way around again with the important important caveat that we do not know much about pre-colonial africa hold on one second contributed to conflict in africa during the slave trades but this was a conflict where ethnic groups were fighting with each other and even with themselves because the europeans were willing to purchase quote unquote slaves and ship them at the other side of the atlantic right and and that makes a lot of sense and i do agree with you with the fact that africans i remember reading a statistic somewhere that about a hundred or years ago or more uh, Africa represented just 5% of the world population, of the human population, and that in 100 years from now, it will represent nearly half of the population. In other words, it's going, it's, it's, it, Africans are growing uh, at a tremendous rate, primarily because diseases decimated entire populations during their, their time. Um, but so I under, understand that, but at the same time, you're familiar with Steven Pinker's argument about the long-term decrease of violence. Yeah, yeah. And so he goes on and looks at, our, you know, looks at the bones of our prehistory ancestors, of our you know, caveman-like ancestors, and says, while wow, 30% or 20%, I can't remember the number, of these people 10,000 years ago or more died through violent means and therefore life has was violent in the prehistory so even though we don't know much about african prehistory but using stephen pinker's argument he would probably say that even though you're right there was abundant land in africa if there was a conflict you could just move and, and go somewhere else uh, at, at the same time there's an implication that maybe there was violence there of course we don't know but these are both counter arguments. Right. My understanding about Pinker's argument is that it is a very long run process. What I can tell you is that the original data that Pinker's work is based on are massively incomplete for Africa. So it's something that you know, neither him nor I can do much about it, mm -hmm. other than we should encourage people to do more original research mm -hmm. about the important pre colonial African kingdoms and perhaps go back in time. Mm -hmm. I'm just was quoting this argument that people have made, which I think for Europe, it does have some intellectual rigor in the sense that clearly the process of continuing fighting led to the establishment of property rights in Europe, which was something that the feudarchs and the landed aristocracy wanted. What did they give? taxes so they were taxed to some extent sometimes they were collecting themselves the taxes so they were keeping keeping a cut as in this country in the united kingdom in some other places it was not like that but this led to the establishment of some states that over time they consolidated and this gradually it was a very gradual process and then through this great innovation of nationalism which to a great extent was done through compulsory private education, compulsory public education, this now led to the French having like a strong identity or the Italians having a strong identity. This process didn't happen in Africa because Europeans arrived and they put the Asante to live together with groups that they have been fighting the Asante for many years and also some people from the Northern Territories with different religion, different uh, you know, practices all together. Then they leave and then suddenly Ghana, you know, it's now the amalgam of three different uh, colonial artifacts. People there have to somehow come and agree and say, oh, we are Ghanaians now. Forget the ethnic groups or forget the divisions during colonization. We are free men now. And, you know, we need to decide on, you know, how to govern us. And I'm just saying that this process in Europe was a much, much more gradual process, way more organic. And your map, cleanly illustrate this process.
Right. The map that I just showed uh, ooh, yeah, with yeah. the borders changing. Um, I, I want to respect your time, Professor, and I really thank you so much for your time. I just want to get to a couple more things uh, before we end. Number one, I want to ask you what your current research is, what your next project is. How can people find out about you and your projects? And then maybe at the end, uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk later, uh, some other time in the future, later this year, uh, I want to send you one of the things I'm working on myself uh, regarding the African borders and get your feedback on that. But that's perhaps for a different podcast in the future. So let's finish up with uh, what are you working on now and how do people get a hold of you or at least uh, find out about your research? Thanks for the question. So uh, first, you know, they can visit my website. Uh, if, you, if they Google search Elias Papayuano uh, at the London Business School, uh, you will be directed to my website. For all of my papers, uh, you can find non-technical uh, surveys, um, a lot of the maps uh, that we're using in this type of research, and most of the data uh, that we have been constructing ourselves or we have been using from others, and also some interviews uh, for the general public. And I'll put your, now, I'll put the link to your website. The second, on your second question, uh, I was uh, very privileged and honored to receive the, a very big grant Grant from the European Research Council, which is the analog of the National Science Foundation, wow. to continue okay. my research together with Stelios Michalopoulos from Brown on the colonial now origins of African development. And we have this project started uh, one year ago exactly. It's a four year long project. Mm. We're trying to get hold of the various arrangements that the colonial administration had with those private corporations that effectively were the main, if you like, force of European colonization in Africa, with some exceptions. Starting with the Dutch? I remind to your, to, your, to your viewers that Zimbabwe was Rhodesia, right. uh, you know, which was because Cecil Rhodes, one of the richest people, persons at the time, this very big country uh, was initially part of a concessionary agreement that he, that, that he got. Wasn't and it was not only, it was also contemporary Zambia. Cecil Rhodes was running part of the diamond industry in South Africa, had a presence in Malawi, in North Mozambique. So the point here is that we want to understand how exactly this relationship between the private firms and the colonial administration was playing out because effectively we tend to believe that you know, uh, Zimbabwe, perhaps Zimbabwe is not a good example. Zambia was like a British colony, but effectively the presence of the British during that time was minimal. Uh, you had like those private corporations that of course empowered local chiefs. Did uh, South Africa start as, as a Dutch private company as well or not really? Yeah, exactly. So, but South Africa wouldn't fit much in, in, in our discussion so far because South Africa is colonized actually quite early. It is perhaps the only place in Africa where Europeans fight with each other, the Dutch versus the, the, the British. Mm -hmm. uh, and also in South Africa, and to a lesser extent in, in, in Zimbabwe, we had considerable European presence. Obviously not as big as the indigenous population, mm -hmm. but in South Africa we had the because latitude and living conditions were actually quite favorable to Europeans. It was a place where Europeans, Dutch, and subsequently British, and subsequently many others, you know, migrated en masse. Right, right. In relative time. So that, we won't hear from that research paper until the year 2022. No, no, we will have some preliminary, we hope to have some preliminary results, uh, perhaps uh, in, in, let's say in a year, perhaps less. Well, I would love, look forward to hearing from them and I look forward to hearing that. And uh, thank you so much again for your time. I'll put a link to how people can find out about some of your research in the show notes. And thank, thank you, you, Francis. Okay. Yeah, I thank look you. forward to chatting again. Likewise. Thank you.